Hi, my name is Stella Archuleta and I'm 47 years old. I have been a follower of Christ since I was 19. I grew up in a Catholic home in California, very devout and strict, um, went to Catholic school, the whole spiel. I learned about God um, and I had a heart for people, but I knew my senior year, um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, and my art teacher, Ms. Morris, had given me a pamphlet on Youth of the Mission, YWAM, um, about a discipleship training program, and so I decided to go ahead and do that. I went to Tyler, Texas, and went through the training, went through teachings and worship, and realized that I was missing something, and so there in Tyler at 19, I um, accepted Christ in my heart and I got baptized there in the lake and um, stayed with Youth of the Mission for about 12 years. We were with Youth of the Mission for 12 years and during that time I did experience a lot. I was married and had children that time. Um, we went on a missions trip, short term, some long term. I did experience um, seeing youth groups. We brought them to Mexico. We saw, we saw the Lord work with um, families that lived in the dump, we saw, we did child evangelism, we did several things and I got to see and experience God in so many ways that I never even thought I'd ever see. Um, we went to uh, Pennsylvania after that and we're, we're going to pioneer a dis, uh, disaster relief ministry. But God closed the doors and so we decided to leave missions and come to Abilene. Once we came back to Abilene, uh, my husband left my children and I, and so we decided to stay here because I was scared and didn't know what else to do. I uh, was pretty devastated. Several years later, I did end up getting remarried. Uh, I did, he struggled with some addictions and I probably experienced more grief in my life emotionally, physically, and financially, just because it tore my whole family apart. Uh, the, I, I never felt abandoned by the Lord, but I did feel somewhat abandoned by people just because of, as a Christian, divorce isn't always looked upon as the best, but at the time I felt like I was drowning and it was either survive or drown. So I did choose to divorce and, um, I can tell you that this church, John and Charlie and Nathan and Meredith and Travis walked us through so much. I cannot even tell you how much I appreciate them and for all they have given to me, the prayers and the support. And so I, I'm so thankful and blessed. And even though my life, I guess, isn't like the picket fence and the, you know, kids and the marriage and all that, it's not that, but I am blessed and I have peace and I'm, su I'm so thankful for what I do have. The way the world works now, there's so much tragedy, so much grief and despair and depression. Uh, I would, and I could have had that, and I'm not saying I didn't have some of that, but I never felt like I was in the depths of despair because I knew that the Lord was holding me in his hands and I, my name was engraved in his hands and there's a song that is so beautiful and I would play that song over and over again how my name is engraved in his hands because he has me and he loves me and so I would just have to share that you know people that are hurting that there is he's there and he's ready to hold us and to make us whole without Christ I would I wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to raise my children to have to know the Lord, to know that there is more, to know that there is hope. I think that um, hope is a is a word that has so many different aspects to it, and um, I, that's how I see the Lord: is He is our hope. He is hope. Uh, today, we want to continue to keep the Stotts family. Craig and Tiffany are our worship leaders here at the gathering. Uh, we were over, many of us, over at a service for uh, Craig's brother, Cameron, who was tragically killed uh, 10 days ago over in Midland. We went to that service on Monday. Tremendous celebration of life 
uh, for Cameron, but there's a family in Midland and here in Abilene trying to pick up the pieces, and so we want to continue to pray for the Stotts family, but we're thankful for our production team, our worship team, all those here at the gathering who step up, and uh, when things happen, we just make it happen. That's just what we do, and I'm thankful uh, for each person who's contributed as Craig's been away, and I know he is as well. Uh, This morning, we're going to be in John chapter 21. Uh, We're going to be talking about human hungers. I came across an article recently. Uh, Psychologists tell us that the average human being, or most human beings, or all human beings, however you want to read it, has 16 basic desires. I don't know if this is true or not. I'm not a psychologist, but 16 different desires from influencing people to independence to acceptance to inclusion to eating. That's one for me. I'm sure they missed a whole other category, the 17th, which is chocolate. Uh, but the human beings, we, we have desires. We have uh, drives inside of us. And in our text today, the disciples seem to be hungry. And not in the way you might imagine. They're, they're hungry, though. They, they'd already seen the resurrected Christ at least twice. But it seems as though they're unsure of what their next steps would be. Some time had passed since they had seen Jesus, and they're back in Galilee. It seems like the natural human desires are taking over. Uh, their desired influence had been crushed by Jesus' death. And now they're desiring to influence in a new way. They're desiring normalcy wanting to create a new normal, trying to figure out what is next. What what does the next chapter look like of their lives? And it looks like they're hungry, hungry to begin that new normal. I want us to read in John chapter 21. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 14. John tells us in verse 21, verse 1, Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, knowing, uh, towing the the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore and about, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew. It was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Get the picture here. The disciples are all together. They don't know which way to go. Perhaps their families think of them as weird, a fraud. They gave up three years of their lives to follow this guy named Jesus. He's been killed. Reports are now circulating that he's been resurrected, but, but they still weren't clear about what that meant for their life. And so what now? So, so I imagine this scene as they're sitting around in silence, un, unsure of what to do next. Perhaps out of the awkward silence, Simon Peter declares, I'm going fishing. It was what they knew. It was what they had done before they followed Jesus. And it's where they would return for comfort. Because they were unsure of what life held for them next. It must have sounded like a good idea because the others go with them and follow Peter into the boat. And so they're fishing and Peter caught nothing throughout the evening, into the early parts of the morning. Nothing. They they had to be hungry and tired and frustrated. This wasn't just a sport. It's how you lived. It's a livelihood. And so here they are with a desire to be competent in their work, a desire for normalcy, a desire for food, and they're failing to satisfy that very basic desire. They're hungry, they're no doubt tired, and no doubt they're frustrated. 
Sounds about like my experiences with fishing. Some of you I know do a lot better, but that sounds about like how it goes when I go fishing. Why were the fish not biting this early spring morning? That the life that had previously been marked with familiarity and comfort, they knew how to fish, now brought no results. It was no longer their life. You ever reached the point of hunger before? You know what hunger is. It's that, that feeling of, of weakness or, or discomfort that's caused by a, a lack of food. I'm sure we all know what, what hunger is. Uh, around our house, uh, we have the term hangry. It starts on good days at 5 or 5.30, some days at like 4 or 4.30. Uh, short fuses, tantrums, uh, losing the mind, uh, nuclear meltdowns. And you thought I was talking about our kids. Point the finger right here. Not over there at my wife, talking right here. The disciples are hungry. They have a desire for normalcy, a desire to eat, and it's just not working out. The life they lived is no longer their life, and they're hungry for something different. Spiritual hunger. The disciples are having to let go of their unfulfilled promises and unrealized hopes and dreams of their life with Jesus. I think we could say, uh, talk about spiritual hunger as a feeling of, of weakness or discomfort at our own circumstances. A craving that is going unfulfilled in our lives. You, you know what that's like, don't you? I want you to think for a minute about what unfulfilled promises you've experienced. There's a, a booklet in the chair in front of you. If, you. if you haven't been with us for a couple weeks, if you have been, you may have that uh, with you. But, but I want, invite you to take that. That's yours to keep. Uh, to, to go over this week, maybe you would want to even take some notes as we're, we're talking this morning about unfulfilled promises you've experienced. Because hunger is a part of the human story. Desire is a part of the human story. But what are some of your unrealized hopes and dreams? It's important that we're honest about this. What, what desires and pleasures are, are you seeking out? You know, desire is, is interesting, isn't it? Interesting that humans have this. Just one more level on the game. He says, my son says, once I get to this level, I'll be done. J just one more tweak to the car, he begs. Once we bump up the mileage and get this tweak done, it'll be exactly where we want it to be. Just one more lotion, she asks. Once I put that on, my skin will be perfect, and I won't need to do anything else. Desire, hunger, it's a part of the human experience. We, we've expanded our desire ever for more human connection into a never-ceasing parade of physical and social desires as well. It's amplified by marketers. It's enabled by commerce. We race down the endless road faster and faster at greater and greater expense. We're left wanting, desiring, not satisfied. The disciples, like us, are left wanting, unfulfilled desires, hunger. The fact that Galilee was home for the disciples leads us to suspect, we don't know this for sure, but leads us to suspect that the story places the disciples long enough after the resurrection that their faith had begun to wear a bit thin. That they returned to Galilee could indicate to us that they're not there to wait for Jesus. They're there to pick up the pieces of their lives. They're there to get on with things, to, to pick up all the broken pieces and try to build something out of it. And so when Peter announced to the others he was going fishing and says, I'm going fishing, what, what he could have meant, we don't know this for sure, was I'm going back to fishing. I'm hungry, I've got these desires to take care of myself and contribute to the world, and I'm going to go back to my old way of life, to which the other disciples responded, we're, we're coming with you. I don't know about you, but I wonder if we can identify with Peter, points in our life where God seemed to be so near and so real and so abundant and so awesome, and then other times when God seemed distant and far away, times when our, our prayers seem to yield an immediate, tangible response, and then times when it feels like our prayers have gone unanswered altogether. And so I can identify with Peter. I don't know if you can. The, the anguish in their heart as they felt, as they reluctantly had to let go of these unrealized hopes and dreams and hungers they had. What are those for you? Unfulfilled promises, unrealized hopes, dreams you've had for your life, 
hunger that's gone unmet. Maybe those desires that have led you to a place where, where now or before where you would describe your life as disappointed or discouraged or even depressed. But face it, sometimes we want to throw in the towel and just forget it all. And if that's where you find yourself today, take heart. Take heart. There are others that have been down that road before. And so, so think about for a minute about those pleasures that you seek out. Because we've been there. The question is, what do we do when we have these hungers? And, and for some of us, we can go to a really unhealthy place. But what are the desires and pleasures that you seek out? You, you see, in the Gospels, Jesus encountered all kinds of hungry people. They had all kinds of different hunger. Whether it was someone who hungered for unhealthy sexuality, whether it was somebody who hungered for more money by means of greed and extortion, wh- whether it was somebody who hungered for more popularity and more power, or whether it was somebody who had literal hunger pains and did not have food, Jesus knows what it's like to encounter hungry people. They're all over the Bible. You know, in the case of the disciples, there, there was nothing sinful about what they were doing, about their hunger. But I think when we start to look at their story and what they were doing, we can see in them questions we need to ask of ourselves. And I want you to think for a moment about what right now in your life is making you feel tired, frustrated, and maybe even angry. Maybe you have nothing, and praise the Lord, that's awesome. But, but, but are there areas of your life Where you'd say, in this area, I feel tired, I feel hungry, and I feel frustrated. Maybe some of you would say, my entire life feels that way. We are driven by all kinds of desires, and those desires are good. If you believe the article I cited earlier, 16 of them. But, But many of the desires that we have, the hungers we have, have a dark side to them. And some of us, our desire for acceptance has led us to endless hours on social media, longing for that acceptance, constantly trying to share, trying to connect, looking for for one more like, looking for one more hit of dopamine to the brain, which researchers have linked to dopamine, the same thing that triggers an addiction, triggers when we get that like or that notification on, on social media. We think, maybe with this, maybe with this, I'll find acceptance, I'll find connection, they'll be my friend, that they'll join together in life with me. Some of us, our desire for human connection has led us to unhealthy expressions of, of our sexuality, giving ourselves again and again outside the context of marriage for a lifetime. And it's leaving us empty, it's leaving us vulnerable, it's leaving us scarred. For some of us, that hunger manifests itself in pornography. Pornography, research will tell us, intensifies brutality toward and degradation of women. It, it deforms the sexual development of our young people. Pornography is highly addictive. And it has been linked to sex trafficking and prostitution and the victimization of children. For some of us, we've got an image we're trying to uphold. An image that we're hungering after that we want other people to believe about us. And so we spend our life hungering after managing that image. And we we work hard and try to uh, maintain our physical appearance. and And it leads us to overwork. It leads us to potentially neglect our families. To potentially harm our bodies physically to make sure we are seen as strong enough or beautiful enough or important enough. It's a hunger deep inside our soul. What have been those hungers you have that are unhealthy? Some of us have longed for a long time to establish a new normal, but but the, the normal we have in our life is just not working. And it's leaving us tired, it's leaving us hungry, it's leaving us frustrated. And for some of us, it's led to a very dark space. For the disciples, it had been a tough morning for sure. Following Jesus' death, they they had to return to their regularly scheduled programming. They got up early, took their fishing nets, and then nothing. Here they are going back to life as they knew it, and they're not even getting a bite. But notice what happens in the text. Jesus calls out to his hungry and frustrated friends. Friends, haven't you any fish? I wonder what was going through the disciples' mind at this point. They don't know that it's Jesus at this point. I wonder if they're like me, I'd be thinking, who is this guy? Thanks for showing up now. We've been here all night, brother. When, we could have used this advice four or five, six hours ago. What does he know? Thanks, but no thanks. He says, well, throw your net on the other side. 
wonder if any of them spoke up and said, what difference does it make which side of the net we throw our boat on? The fish aren't over here. They're not going to be over here. I mean, what fisherman likes to be told they're not doing their job well or not doing their job right? Anybody in here like a backseat driver? Not a hand went up. Not a hand went up. I just want all the backseat drivers to know not a hand went up when I asked that. No one wants to hear advice from somebody who's not in the game, who doesn't have skin in the game. But by then, these disciples are so hungry, they're desperate to try anything. And so Jesus told them, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And it says, when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Now, this is one of those things where if you aren't first century fishermen, it sounds really easy. Because you may have your image in your mind of what your grandpa had in his garage, just like a stick with a net on it, and you could just easily, like the length of a broom or something, take it in the water and then put it over here. No, these, these, these fishermen had huge nets, and what they would do is they would find a school of fish, and they would have usually a couple of boats. They had these compound or trammel nets that had waders on them. So they would throw the nets out, and they would be attached to the boat, and then the waders would come down, and they would pull the nets tight, and that's how they would catch their fish. And so just throwing the net to the other side took some time. It would have taken some effort. It wasn't an easy task. It would have still required some skill. But the point of this is that what was normal for the disciples was not working. They weren't catching any fish on this side, on the left side of the boat. Normal wasn't working. And I think it can have a parallel to our relationship with the Lord. If we're feeling tired and frustrated and hungry, if we're trapped in endless desires of of unhealthy expressions of those hungers, if if we've been acting on those unhealthy desires, we can keep doing what we're doing. That's a completely viable option. But here's what's going to happen. It doesn't take rocket science to to figure this out. You're going to keep getting the same results you've been getting. You're going to keep getting the same results you've been getting. And some of us this morning are are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and we're sick and tired of being sick and tired and sick and tired, but we know sick and tired and sick and tired. So we don't do anything about being sick and tired and sick and tired because it's comfortable being sick and tired, and it's just where we like to stay, being sick and tired and sick and tired. Because sick and tired is what we know. But what you see in this text is that Jesus meets his disciples in their hunger. That he wants his disciples to to break out of the ordinary, to to do something different. That Jesus meets us in our hunger and he invites us to to do something different. There's a tremendous parallel for our lives, for our story, and how your story is impacted by human hunger. That those frustrations we have, those desires that we have that are going unfulfilled, what is making us sick and tired, today's story is a reminder to, to look over to that shore, to hear and listen for the voice of Jesus and do something different. Do something different. Don't keep doing the same things that keep getting you the same results, but do something different. Listen to his voice and and Jesus is ready to meet you in that hunger and do something different that has never been done before. You see, Jesus comes to meet us in our hunger. And when he comes to meet us in our hunger, it's an invitation to change. It's an invitation to try something different. It's an invitation to throw our nets on the other side. He's going to meet you, but but he's not going to let you keep doing things business as usual. So it's time to listen to his voice, church family. It's time to confess that sin to a trusted friend. Or spouse. It's time to make that call and set up that appointment and visit with somebody who can help you. It it might be time to distance yourself from friends or family who are causing you to live stuck where you are. It may be time to speak up to unhealthy family dynamics that are going on that have kept you trapped and stuck. You see, Jesus doesn't let his followers keep doing business as usual. That was one option he didn't give them. And so those hungers you've been laboring over that are getting you nowhere... Watch for dawn. Look to the shore. Listen to that voice. Do what he tells you to do. Throw that net on the other side. The disciples listen. And then when they do, they realize they can't contain the fish. And they start to get it. Only Jesus 
could have done this. Jesus is the one who makes this possible. And Peter, a man who has blown it big time with Jesus, he starts to realize it's Jesus. And, and he jumps into the water and, and says, it is, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. And so it's out of their frustration and their hunger that they get to see Jesus move and do something in a new way. And you can just see the joy and the anticipation and the desire there with Peter. Because we see in Peter's story, which this text actually sets up, Peter's story, which we're going to look at in a couple of weeks. We're not going to dive all the way into it today. But we see in Peter where our true hungers lie. A relationship with his friend and Savior, Jesus. A covenant relationship with him. And so when the hungry disciples arrive at the shore, Jesus has a fire going. You can smell the smoke, the charcoal. He has some bread. And when he sees his disciples, he simply says, come and have breakfast. Come and have breakfast. After all of this, our hunger is met with an invitation. An invitation to come and have breakfast to his tired, hungry, frustrated friends, other than suggesting that they add some of their catch to the spread, Jesus' sole response was, come and eat breakfast. You see, Jesus wants to satisfy his disciples. Jesus wants to be the one who is filling the disciples' stomach. He, Jesus wants to be the one that fulfills the desires of the human heart. And, and here's the truth. Social media cannot feed your soul. Your image will not feed your soul. Your pride will never feed your soul. Pornography will never feed your soul. Success, no amount of it will ever feed your soul. Gossip will not feed your soul. Comparison to other people will not feed your soul. What will feed your soul is to be in a relationship with Jesus and have him provide for you. That's how we're satisfied. To join him on the beach. Breakfast on the beach with the risen Lord. You know, what would have happened if the disciples would have refused to throw their net on the right side of the boat? I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. I think I know that they would have missed out on a wonderful breakfast on the beach with Jesus. What happens when you and I refuse to do the things Jesus calls us to do? Well, we too miss out on the blessings that he had for us. Because the good news is that God is a faithful God. He's abounding in love. He's steadfast in love. And he's coming. He sees his hungry disciple, his friends, and he says, I, I want to bless you. I want to come to you. All hope is not lost. And so in our hunger, Jesus calls us back in to fellowship with him. He satisfies our hunger. You see, they had that catch, not because they got lucky, but because they listened to the Lord. And so the question that we have to wrestle with is, am I willing to listen for the voice of the Lord and act on it? The story is really not about fishing. It's about trusting the Lord. It's about listening to the Lord's voice. Come and have breakfast. Come and eat. Satisfy the longing of your soul for nourishment and sustenance and life and all its abundance. And the devotional, devotions for the beach and days you wish you were there, which is most days for me. The author states, we create so much unnecessary hoopla in our own regularly scheduled programming. We plan, we implement, and we work hard. And we get frustrated when nothing seems to come of it. Desperate and empty, we finally look to Jesus as a last resort. Because we often don't recognize who he is. And sometimes, really all he's asking is that we come join him. And take part in what he's already prepared and what he's already created. The rest will come. So declutter your mind of plans, schedules, to-do lists. Instead, look out upon the waves. Wiggle your toes in the sand. Absorb the sights and the sounds and the smells. And enjoy the moment for what it is. Not what it means, not what lies ahead, not how you arrived there. There'll be time for that. For now, just enjoy the moment. You, you may be looking at your life, and you may be hungering for a new season, a new chapter, wondering what is ahead for you. Friends, the invitation is here, that in that moment, Jesus wants that connection with you. 
He wants that fellowship, that friendship, and and that invitation to the disciples is that invitation to you. Come, break the fast, feast on the riches of God's love that's been revealed in the resurrected Christ. Satisfy the longings of your soul for sustenance and life. Break that fast. Come to Jesus and hunger no more. Pioneer Drive, my prayer for us is that we're people who sit with Jesus, who come and join Jesus in what he's prepared and what he's created. And that at the deepest core of who we are is a hunger to be with him and to be where he is. Let's be with him, church family. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you come to satisfy the longings of our heart. Uh, This morning, I, I don't know where everybody in this room is and where everybody watching online is. There could be hungers for a million different things. Some of them healthy, some of them unhealthy. Lord, I pray that in our frustration and our angst, our anger, that, Lord, we, we take a moment, and if, if we're doing things in our life that aren't working out for us, that are unhealthy, that are leading us to get the same results again and again, help us to listen to your voice and try something different. Be bold enough to throw our net to the other side. And then to accept the invitation to sit with you, to be with you, to dine with you, to let you be the one who fills our soul, to let you be the one who satisfies the longings of our heart, and that no amount of worldly success or pleasure or acceptance will come close to the love and acceptance we get in you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.